Chapter 18 of The Ghost, a Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 18. The Struggle. When I got back to my little sitting room at the Hotel du Portugal, I experienced a certain timid hesitation in opening the door. For several seconds I stood before it, the key in the lock, afraid to enter. I wanted to rush out again, to walk the streets all night. It was raining, but I thought that anything would be preferable to the inside of my sitting room. Then I felt that, whatever the cost, I must go in, and, twisting the key, I pushed heavily at the door and entered, touching as I did so the electric switch. In the chair which stood before the writing table in the middle of the room sat the figure of Lord Clarenceau. Yes, my tormentor was indeed waiting. I had defied him, and we were about to try a fall. As for me, I may say that my heart sank, sick with an ineffable fear. The figure did not move as I went in. Its back was towards me. At the other end of the room was the doorway which led to the small bedroom, little more than an alcove, and the gaze of the apparition was fixed on this doorway. I closed the outer door behind me and locked it, and then I stood still. In the looking-glass over the mantelpiece, I saw a drawn, pale, agitated face in which all the trouble of the world seemed to reside. It was my own face. I was alone in the room with the ghost, the ghost which, jealous of my love for the woman it had loved, meant to revenge itself by my death. A ghost, did I say? To look at it, no one would have taken it for an apparition. No wonder that till the previous evening I had never suspected it to be other than a man. It was dressed in black. It had the very aspect of life. I could follow the creases in the frock coat, the direction of the nap of the silk hat which it wore in my room. How well by this time I knew that faultless black coat and that impeccable hat. It had seemed that I could not examine them too closely. I pierced them with the intensity of my fascinated glance. Yes, I pierced them. For, showing faintly through the coat, I could discern the outline of the table which should have been hidden by the man's figure, and through the hat I could see the handle of the French window. As I stood motionless there, solitary under the glow of the electric light with this fearful visitor, I began to wish that it would move. I wanted to face it, to meet its gaze with my gaze, eye to eye, and will against will. The battle between us must start at once, I thought, if I was to have any chance of victory. For, moment by moment, I could feel my resolution, my manliness, my mere physical courage, slipping away. But the apparition did not stir. Impassive, remorseless, sinister, it was content to wait, well aware that all suspense was in its favour. Then I said to myself that I would cross the room, and so attain my object. I made a step, and drew back, frightened by the sound of a creaking board. Absurd! But it was quite a minute before I dared to make another step. I had meant to walk straight across to the other door, passing in my course close by the occupied chair. I did not do so. I kept round by the wall, creeping on tiptoe, and my eye never leaving the figure in the chair. I did this in spite of myself, and the manner of my action was the first hint of an ultimate defeat. At length I stood in the doorway leading to the bedroom. I could feel the perspiration on my forehead and at the back of my neck. I fronted the inscrutable white face of the thing which had once been Lord Clamonceau, the lover of Rosetta Rosa. I met its awful eyes, dark, invidious, fateful. Ah, those eyes! Even in my terror I could read in them all the history, all the characteristics of Lord Clarenceau. They were the eyes of one capable at once of the highest and of the lowest. Mingled with their hardness was a melting softness, with their cruelty a large benevolence, with their hate a pitying tenderness, with their spirituality a hellish turpitude. They were the eyes of two opposite men, and as I gazed into them, they reconciled for me the conflicting accounts of Lord Clanosso, which I had heard from different people. But as far as I was concerned, that night the eyes held nothing but cruelty and disaster. Though I could detect in them the other qualities, 
those qualities were not for me. We faced each other, the apparition and I, and the struggle, silent and bitter as the grave, began. Neither of us moved. My arms were folded easily, but my nails pressed in the palms of my clenched hands. My teeth were set, my lips tight together, my glance unswerving. By sheer strength of endeavour, I cast aside all my forebodings of defeat, and in my heart I said with the profoundest conviction that I would love Rosa, though the seven seas and all the continents gave up their dead to frighten me. So we remained. For how long I do not know. It may have been hours. It may have been only minutes. I cannot tell. Then gradually there came over me a feeling that the ghost in the chair was growing larger. The ghastly, inhuman sneer on his thin, widening lips assaulted me like a giant's malediction, and the light in the room seemed to become more brilliant, till it was almost blinding with the dazzle of its whiteness. This went on for a time, and once more I pulled myself together, collected my scattering senses, and seized again the courage and determination which had nearly slipped from me. But I knew that I must get away, out of sight of this moveless and diabolic figure, which did not speak, but which made known its commands by means of its eyes alone. Resign her, the eyes said. Tear your love for her out of your heart. Swear that you will never see her again, or I will ruin you utterly, not only now, but for evermore. And though I trembled, my eyes answered, No. For some reason which I cannot at all explain, I suddenly took off my overcoat, and, drawing aside the screen which ran across the corner of the room at my right hand, forming a primitive sort of wardrobe, I hung it on one of the hooks. I had to feel with my fingers for the hook, because I kept my gaze on the figure. I will go into the bedroom, I said, and I half turned to pass through the doorway. Then I stopped. If I did so, the eyes of the ghost would be upon my back, and I felt that I could only withstand that glance by meeting it, to have it on my back. Doubtless I was going mad. However, I went backwards through the doorway, and then rapidly stepped out of sight of the apparition, and sat down upon the bed. Useless. I must return. The mere idea of the empty sitting-room, empty with the ghost in it, filled me with a new and stranger fear. Horrible happenings might occur in that room, and I must be there to see them. Moreover, the ghost's gaze must not fall on nothing. That would be too appalling. Without doubt I was mad. Its gaze must meet something. Otherwise it would travel out into space further and further, till it had left all the stars and waggled aimlessly in the ether. The notion of such a calamity was unbearable. Besides, I was hungry for that gaze. My eyes desired those eyes. If that glance did not press against them, they would burst from my head and roll on the floor, and I should be compelled to go down on my hands and knees and grope in search for them. No, no, I must return to the sitting-room. And I returned. The gaze met me in the doorway. And now there was something novel in it, an added terror, a more intolerable menace, a silent imprecation so frightful that no human being could suffer it. I sank to the ground, and as I did so, I shrieked. But it was an unheard shriek, sounding only within the brain. And in reply to that unheard shriek, I heard the unheard voice of the ghost crying, Yield! I would not yield. Crushed, maddened, tortured by a worse than any physical torture, I would not yield. But I wanted to die. I felt that death would be sweet and utterly desirable. And, so thinking, I faded into a kind of coma, or rather a state which was just short of coma. I had not lost consciousness, but I was conscious of nothing but the gaze. Goodbye, Rosa, I whispered. I'm beaten, but my love has not been conquered. The next thing I remembered was the paleness of the dawn at the window. The apparition had vanished for that night and I was alive. But I knew that I had touched the skirts of death. I knew that after another such night I should die. The morning chocolate arrived, and by force of habit I consumed it. 
I felt no interest in any earthly thing. My sole sensation was a dread of the coming night, which all too soon would be upon me. For several hours I sat, pale and nerveless, in my room, despising myself for a weakness and a fear which I could not possibly avoid. I was no longer my own master. I was the slave, the shrinking shattle of a ghost, and the thought of my condition was a degradation unspeakable. During the afternoon a ray of hope flashed upon me. Mrs. Sullivan Smith was at the Hotel du Rhin, so Rosa had said. I would call on her. I remembered her strange demeanour to me on the occasion of our first meeting, and afterwards at the reception. It seemed clear to me now that she must have known something. Perhaps she might help me. I found her in a garish apartment, too full of Louis-Philippe furniture, robed in a crimson tea-gown, and apparently doing nothing whatever. She had the calm quiescence of a Spanish woman. Yet when she saw me, her eyes burned with a sudden dark excitement. Carl, she said with the most staggering abruptness, you are dying. How do you know? I said morosely. Do I look it? Yet the crystal warned you, she returned, with apparent but not real inconsequence. I want you to tell me, I said eagerly, and with no further pretense. You must have known something then when you maybe look in the crystal. What did you know, and how? She sat a moment in thought, stately, half languid mysterious. First, she said, let me hear all that's happened, then I will tell you. Is Sullivan about? I asked. I felt that if I was to speak I must not be interrupted by that good-natured worldling. Sullivan, she said a little scornfully, with gentle contempt, is learning French billiards. You're perfectly safe. She understood. Then I told her without the least reservation all that had happened to me and especially my experiences of the previous night. When I had finished, she looked at me with her large, sombre eyes, which were full of pity, but not of hope. I waited for her words. Now listen, she said. You shall hear. I was with Lord Clarenceau when he died. You? I exclaimed. In Vienna? But even Rosa was not with him. How? Patience! And do not interrupt me with questions. I am giving away a secret which carries with it my my reputation. Long before my marriage I had known Lord Clarenceau. He knew many women. I was one of them. That affair ended. I married Sullivan. I happened to be in Vienna at the time Lord Clarenceau was taken with brain fever. I was performing at a music hall on the Prater. There was a great rage then for English singers in Vienna. I knew he was alone. I remembered certain things that had passed between us, and I went to him. I helped to nurse him. He was engaged to Rosa, but Rosa was far away and could not come immediately. He grew worse. The doctor said one day that he must die. That night I was by his bedside. He got suddenly up out of bed. I could not stop him. He had the strength of delirium. He went into his dressing room and dressed himself fully, even to his hat without any assistance. Where are you going? I said to him. I am going to her, he said. These cursed doctors say I shall die, but I shan't. I want her. Why hasn't she come? I must go and find her. Then he fell across the bed, exhausted. He was dying. I had rung for help, but no one had come, and I ran out of the room to call on the landing. When I came back, he was sitting up in bed, all dressed and still with his hat on. It was the last flicker of his strength. His eyes glittered. He began to speak. How he stared at me. I shall never forget it. I am dying, he said hoarsely. They were right after all. I shall lose her. I would sell my soul to keep her. Yet death takes me from her. She is young and beautiful and will live many years. But I have loved her. And where I have loved, let others beware. I shall never be far from her. And when another man shall dare to cast his eyes on her, I will curse him. The heat of my jealousy shall blast his very soul. He too shall die. Rosa was mine in life, and she shall be mine in death. My spirit will watch over her, for no man ever loved a woman as I loved Rosa. Those were his very words, Carl. 
Soon afterwards, he died. She recited Clarenceau's last phrases with such genuine emotion that I could almost hear Clarenceau himself saying them. I felt sure that she had remembered them precisely, and that Clarenceau would indeed have employed just such terms. And you believe, I murmured after a long pause, during which I fitted the remarkable narration in with my experiences, and found that it tallied. You believe that Lord Clarenceau could keep his word after death? I believe, she said simply. Then there is no hope for me, Emmeline? She looked at me, vaguely, absently, without speaking, and shook her head. Her lustrous eyes filled with tears. End of chapter 18